So without further ado, let's see. Welcome, Dr. Bill Birch. Pleasure to be here. And uh, I've been doing this with Joe for how many years, Joe? Five or six, anyway. Probably more. <laughs> Could be more than that. Yeah. And I'm going to be honest with you, one of our, our biggest interests, not only to educate you on what's going on in biological dentistry, but to get you to be a member of the academy and get you fellow, get you accredited. So this is going to change your world. It did mine. It changed my whole life. So this is important stuff, and it's just not dentistry. It's how you live your life, how you treat your patients. And we're very, very passionate about this. So I don't know if I need to go any further than that. But my introduction, but that's, that's who I am, where I've been, where I've practiced. I guess I've been in the academy for 20 years, so 20 years of my practice wasn't biological dentistry, but uh, it certainly is now. We're a nonprofit organization. When I was the president five years ago or so, we had 600 members. And now we have over a thousand. So we really have worked hard, really well run organization. We're all volunteers except the people out there at the front desk. But uh, we do this because you know we love what we're doing. And our motto is show me the science. If you don't have science to back it up, then it ain't so. So what we're gonna try to do today and tomorrow and Saturday is to show you the science. You've got two great days coming up. It's uh, Friday and Saturday, the symposium are really for around the world people who are PhDs and research scientists, there could be dentists, physicians, and all kinds of folks in different aspects of healthcare who will be lecturing. IOMT is a trusted academy of allied professionals providing scientific resources to support new levels of integrity and safety in healthcare. And on the healthcare, that's the important thing here. We're not dentists, just be a dentist. In fact, you probably won't see any pictures of teeth this weekend. I'd be surprised if you do. It's not about teeth. You're not going to see pictures of teeth. You're not going to see a new impression material. You're not going to learn anything about making a margin. We all assume you all know that. Um, this is about health and improving people's health, and including yourself and your staff. Because what people don't realize oftentimes is if you're sitting there as a dentist or assistant, um, you're drilling out mercury fillings all day, and you're in a cloud of mercury vapor. And there's a lot of health implications of that. And you'll learn more about that as the weekend goes on. The information you hear at the meeting is derived from science, delivered by clinicians, research scientists, and health professionals that are committed to improving and making healthcare safer for patients and the environment. So it's patients, the environment. In fact, you know, if you put a mercury filling in patients, filling that mercury is now in the environment because whether they have that mercury filling replaced, okay, somebody else sucks it out, it goes into the uh, effluent and out of the building into the water, and now it's in the sewer system, eventually it's going to be in the streams and rivers. And if they die, they're going to be cremated, or they're going to be buried. So that mercury is forever in the environment. So don't think about it just as a tooth. Think about it as the environmental impact here. And that's one of the directions that we had to go in, is to consider the environmental impact of mercury, um, just not the health impacts of it. But there's a lot of it. Tom Dabrinsky will probably bring it up later. Uh, he's a dentist at Yale. Um, and he's done some interesting research on health problems that particularly dentists have as if they retire. So trust me, after 40 years of dentistry, I'm thinking of retiring. Yeah, it's, in the, it's in the plan anyway. No time to The disclaimer, the material presented here is intended strictly as a set of suggestions. A licensed practitioner must make up his or her mind concerning specific treatment options. Biological dentistry is not a separate recognized specialty. We all know that. Um, what it is, is a branch of something you can go ahead and practice, you can start changing, but we don't include ourselves as a specialist or specialty. Um, here's a little bit about how I got into this. Um, 25 years ago or so, my aunt my whole family grew up in South Jersey. I came here ninth grade, I think it was, from different areas out of the all over the country. My dad was a steam turbine engineer. So we're there, there to build a power plant. He's there to build it. We were there for six months, there six months. But so anyway, uh, my aunt Bye came down from New Jersey to North Carolina. And five days just lay, just all the time laughing. And when she laughed, her mouth opened a lot. I know she had a mouthful of black buildings, what's a mountain of buildings, I would call them at the time. Well, aunt Bye had uh, little, 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 you know, Alzheimer's disease. And we knew it at the time, she was, you know, not far along with. But as she progressed, 
we later found out that two of her children also developed it. So that got me thinking about heavy metal mercury and the connection, possible connection, to neurological diseases. And of course there is. So my decision was either change what I'm doing for a living, which is not exactly easy, or change how I practice. So I decided to change how I practice because you know, there's kind of a familial tendency to develop the same diseases so far I'm fine. But thank God for the IOT being able to change the way I practice. So they joined the IOT and well, 20 plus years ago probably. And I'll never forget the first meeting was at, um, in Durham, North Carolina. And I walked into the room. There might have been 20 dentists in there. Maybe not even that many, I'm not sure now. But there was kind of a Birkenstock group. These guys had ponytails, they had Birkenstock shoes on. And as I said earlier, the weirdest group of dentists because nobody was talking about teeth. I was like, what the heck kind of meeting is this? But what they were talking about was dangers of fluoride and the dangers of mercury. I'm going, oh, you guys are nuts. You know, my university told me this stuff's okay. I mean, we have to put it in a jar when we're done with the scrap. But outside of that, nobody told me any of this stuff. So it took me a while to really kind of understand this and understand what they were talking about was true. So it took several years to kind of build up totally into the concept. But back then, we didn't have nearly the equipment we have today to protect yourself. But it was an interesting, interesting meeting to say the least. So my evolution was from not knowing anything about it. You guys are in a position probably because we have a lot more interest in the press, with magazines, newspapers, whatever, about mercury. We're aware of it. Back then, nobody cared about mercury. We would drop mercury thermometers, break them, roll red mercury around as kids, we sure did, and it wasn't any problem. Today we know. If you break a thermometer in a school, mercury thermometer, it's evacuated. It's a hazmat situation. So apparently something's changed. Mercury hasn't, but our perception has. And so does our patients. So does, you know, the common consumer knows about mercury. And they don't look like teeth. And this is Carl saying, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Meaning that just because you can't prove it, definitely this connection doesn't mean there's not a connection. And we're again, we can't prove it. We believe it. We have a lot of science that shows that to be true, but for actual fact, I can't say it. When you die, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. It's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that it's tough. I love that one. Will Rogers. Well, the history of mercury joints. Mercury became super paste in the seventh century. It is all copper, or the Chinese is like copper, uh, tin and uh, silver shavings uh, and made mercury or uh, metal paste out of it. They didn't have a particular use for it at that time, but they discovered that it, it was a soft putty and it hardened. Now, an interesting thing about this is that silver coins at the time were just a silver coin. And then later they decided to put ridges on the outside of the coin so that if anybody shaved the coin to make, you know, to get the silver out of it, you could tell it. Because if they didn't have any ridges on it, obviously someone's been shaving it. And back then, you know, coins were worth something. They were real, either gold or silver. In 1816, Augustus Grove created the first amount of filling uh, by combining elemental mercury, silver shavings, and silver coins. And then in 1833, the Krakow brothers, two French guys that moved to England, and then they came to New York City, were probably like the first commercial dentists. And what they did, they set up a clinic and they were using mercury fillings. Notice I said mercury, not amalgam, because we call mercury fillings. Some people call them silver, mercury, but amalgam, but they're mercury. Um, so they were making a feeling, uh, putting mercury fillings to people. Well, at the time, the uh, first amalgam war, because the American, uh, American College of Dental Surgeons were only using gold, and they discovered that, you know, back then they knew about bad habit, they knew about mercury poison from the habit belting industry. And there was a bit of a war going on. So if you wanted to be a member of the American Academy of Dental Surgeons, you could not use mercury. Well, from that, uh, a branch came along that decided we're going to use mercury fillings, but they were kicked out of the other organization, and they decided that would be the ADA. So anybody that used mercury fillings was in the ADA, American Dental Association. And the term quack was actually used for the ADA dentists because they were using mercury, which is quicksilver in Germany. So 
quack store, excuse me. So the quack part came from the, the dentist who started using the mercury filling as opposed to the ones that didn't. And this is just showing that, you know, the, the, the reason that the barbers used to be dentists at the time, I guess you could say, because they had to be able to chair the lay back. So it was kind of easy to do extractions in the chair that lay back as opposed to one that was upright. So medical filling has been placed for nearly 200 years, and that's not a reason to change, I don't know what it is. And in 1850, Merck decided to study, and I told about that, and there's the bad pattern. And they would stand over bats and mercury chloride, put wool in that, stir it, stir it, stir it, heating it, and the mercury would come off, and they were made as a hat, which is not a good thing because of the government bandits in the building industry in 1940, or 1941, I think it was. That was the uh, first mercury war. Then the second mercury war came out before World War II, and a uh, German chemist played with mercury, and he was the first to coin uh, micro-mercurialism in 1926 and recognize that mercury silver fillings were a dangerous source of mercury for patients. And that's 1926. And a German chemist, Korinsky, did experiments on itself, placing amount of fillings and the mercury in his body. And uh, he discovered that the mercury filling, the mercury was actually coming out of the urine and feces. So he was measuring that. I don't know what the measuring equipment was like in 1931, but I gotta give you that credit. He was actually measuring uh, urine and mercury uh, and feces uh, levels, because that would have been, I would have thought, quite difficult. And the controversy lasted until World War II broke out. And then there was more important things to worry about in Europe. And then the third amount of war, which we're still in, uh, Dr. Pinto from Brazil and Hal Huggins. Anybody heard of Hal Huggins? I'm sure some of you have heard of that. He, he contributed a lot to what we're doing today. He's a really, really good guy. And Matt has a Swedish neurobiologist working on it. And funny, mercury poisoning is coming to Delaware homes. And then the IOT was founded from the goal of producing, or producing the science to convince dentists to eliminate mercury. We're still working at it. And that was 1984. Some of those original members are here. Um, Dave Reggiani, for sure. He's not in this room, but we talked to him last night. And the controversy continues. We're still dealing with it. Maybe not as much as a war, but it's certainly a battle. So just to run down, a few key cases in the dental Malibu wars. 26, uh, Alfred, or, uh, Al Alfred Stock defined micro-materialism. Berminsky discovered urine and fecal excretion of mercury after placing on fillings. 1980, Dr. Pinto and Dr. Huggins in America, <coughs> Matt Hansen in Sweden, uh, re reviewed objection to dental mercury. 1984, IOMT was founded. And in 2000, a number of countries banned uh, mercury, Norway, Sweden, uh, Finland, Japan no longer teaches it. So, uh, you know, the world's changing, and we're just going to try to stay in front of it. And now in 18, or 19, or 2016, the EPA is currently proposing standards for discharging of dental pollutants. I don't know about any of you guys, we all have mercury separators in our basement, so that anything, that, you know, when you suck in those fillings out, that water's going somewhere and it's going into the sewer system. So you gotta have a way to remove that. And these filters today are removing up to 99% of that wastewater mercury. So it doesn't go into our streams and rivers. Fundamentals of mercury. You guys know this stuff, it's basic science from chemistry. It's a heavy metal, atomic weight of 80. Uh, atomic number, excuse me, the weight's 200. Uh, metal, uh, liquid at room temperature. Only metal I know of is a liquid. You know, I think we're cussed by those of metal, because it would be strange to look at mercury and say it's a metal. Um, it's cup gases, they colorless, odorless, and tasteless. Vaporizes above 10 degrees Fahrenheit and the vapor uh, vaporization doubles for every 50 degrees. So we're basically 100 degrees, so you know, vaporization is twice as much as it would be at, at 10 degrees. And very reactive, very easy to donate an electron and, and the process of oxidation, which it does readily in the body. Um, it forms mercury, elemental mercury uh, forms in either liquid or vapor, 80% um, uptake. In, in the lungs, so the metal vapor, mercury vapor coming off your fillings, 80% of that is being absorbed into your body. That's a very high rate. It uh, crosses the blood-brain barrier, moderate uptake in the intestines, so it's, 
It's not charged. Mercury vapor is going to balance at zero, so it can pass through the cell wall and be readily absorbed. Mercurius has lost an electron, and then Mercuric has lost two electrons, and that uses an inorganic mercury salt formed by oxidation, and it's not as readily uptake in the body as the vapor is. So it does not cross the blood vein barrier. So we often say that, you know, we always use a, a, a vinyl dam when we're taking that mercury filling. You'll learn more about that. But, you know, it's not a perfect system. There are particles that do get in, in the patient's mouth and they're swallowed and they usually pass through the gut without much trouble. There can be some uh, stomach irritation from them, but there's not as much absorption that way as there is with, with the vapor. Methyl mercury is formed by bacterial uh, connection synthesis in the mouth and the gut, 95% uh, uh, methyl mercury is absorbed in the intestines, good mobility, and crosses the blood brain barrier. And remember that the methylation occurs in the mouth and in the gut. And then we've got ethyl mercury. Glycerol is a preservative place in vaccines, and that's the thing that we are so against. And the AMA, American Medical Association, doesn't seem to have a problem with it. Is we're convinced that problems with autism and these other things with children is coming from the preservative in the vaccine. Now, it seems like a pretty logical thing to me that mercury in a vaccine is probably not a good thing, but it kills the bacteria in the vaccine so that it's safer to give, but I don't know how safe that would be. Um, I remember some statistics on 1980, autism was one in 500,000 children. Today it's one in 164. So the cause, I can tell you exactly, could be a combination of mercury, fluoride, any number of environmental factors. You know that we have a lot more chemicals, poisons, and things in our environment now than we did in 1980, but there's definitely an increase of autism. What is methylation? Uh, unique factor related to mercury exposure and individual response. Everybody has an individual response to this. Uh, we don't all act the same to mercury or any other chemical for that matter. Bacteria in soil can convert mercury from the environment into methyl mercury, which is why pregnant women and children have been advised to restrict consumption of certain types of seafood because it is methylated. Other forms of mercury might be older than the methyl mercury inside the body. We talked about that. Studies have documented the ability of mercury in the human system, such as that of the mountain fillings, to be transformed into methyl mercury in the mouth by specific strands of yeast and bacteria. So if it's in your mouth, it can be methylated. It's in your mouth because it's mercury vapor. So it's methylated and then easily absorbed into the body. Why the issue of methylation is essential? Because humans are exposed to inorganic mercury from dental amalgams, food, and industrial pollutants. Potential mercury methylization by the human gut microbe would have tremendous health implications. So we talk about fish, the role of selenium. Selenium has the strongest affinity for mercury. Bio groups, which are sulfur groups, have a very strong affinity, but mercury, or excuse me, selenium, is much stronger. If mercury binds to selenium before it enters the body, it will be less toxic because it's bound to the selenium. It's not available for reaction. If mercury binds to selenium after it enters the body, it will be more difficult to remove. So the binding of selenium is very, very tight. Now this is going back to the fish idea. Selenium is an antioxidant, a very strong antioxidant. And when it binds to oxygen, it protects against free radical damage from certain chemicals that can cause cancer. So it's a very good antioxidant to have. Fish are high in selenium. And what happens is that the selenium binds to the mercury, protects the fish. So they're not affected by the mercury because it's found and it's usually in more of their nervous system. But when you eat the meat, there's a certain amount of mercury in that. I'll show you later, that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is the mercury vapor that we're breathing. That's where the mercury contamination for people's coming from, not so much from the diet. Mercury in fish has already reacted with proteins in uh, other protective molecules. Mercury bound to selenium is not as toxic as an equal amount of mercury would be. So saying that eating fish is probably not as harmful as breathing mercury vapor. We know it's not. So we're not suggesting you stop eating fish, but you know they always advise pregnant mothers to maybe watch the consumption of it. Certain fish are higher too, uh, the higher the food chain, the tunas, the king mackerels, and the, 
The long living fish, the big fish, are the ones that have the most mercury. So shrimp and other creatures like that are lower on the food chain. All right, now we're going to talk about mercury's affinity for, for uh, sulfur or thiol groups. It forms a covalent bond with the sulfur. More than 95% of enzymes contain sulfur. Mercury will bind to sulfur groups to disrupt the function of the enzyme. And many of these enzymes are for detoxification. So what we're saying is that sulfur groups bind really quickly to mercury and with the covalent bond. So if you've got an enzyme, which is a sulfur group, which 99% of them are, mercury binds to that, that enzyme no longer works. And if it's a detoxifying enzyme, you're not detoxifying. So you're building up toxins in the body. Mercury has an affinity for methionine, cysteine, cysteine. When mercury binds to an enzyme, the enzyme no longer functions. So it's kind of like the key and the keyhole. You know, the key fits that slot. If you put mercury on that enzyme, it no longer fits in the slot. And that's how enzymes work. They, they connect to the cell. So once that is there, you can measure it, but it's not functioning. <coughs> Relative to toxicity of heavy metals, well, we always love labels the call for arsenic, but here's, here's a list of the, of the toxicity. Mercury, cadmium, we find cadmium, uh, what we do with a lot of our patients is they do a heavy metal challenge test to find out, number one, how much mercury and heavy metals are in your body. And physicians do this for us, we don't do it. That's another thing you have to be careful about, don't be a physician here. If you have an alternative physician to work with, they can do this testing real easily. But we find a lot of cadmium in cigarette smokers, but it's in the back that comes out of the soil, I guess, but that's where you're find your cadmium. Arsenic, surprisingly, that's third on the list. Uh, was it Blanche Taylor more working for her? She killed three husbands with arsenic. Anybody remember that story? That was a long time ago. Thallium, and then here in the bottom of the list is lead. So lead's not a good actor, but it's not as poisonous as you might have, we might have thought earlier, because mercury certainly is number one. And years ago, this Newsweek article came out, you know, with lead paint. Remember, I don't know, I, I worked my way through dental school and undergraduate painting houses and wallpaper here in town. And uh, I did all the Lindy's and Arthur Treasures and some other ones that were going up at the time. But they changed the rules and took lead out of paint. Well, back then, it was kind of like taking lead out of paint to painters. It was kind of like making dentists wear rubber gloves. You know, you can't do it. It won't work. <laughs> back when they when they made us wear gloves and mandated that, you know, here's surgeons that have been wearing gloves for years. We bought dentists, we couldn't do dentistry with a glove on, but we we seen we seen the mandate. Heavy metal synergy. What happens when you combine lethal dose LD one of mercury and the lethal dose of lead? Well, it's a hundred times more toxic. The point being that we have more than mercury to worry about in the body. We have lead. And if you've got fluoride in your water, you've got lead in your water. It comes in with fluoride. Dr. Kennedy will talk about that this afternoon. Great lecture. It's really entertaining. But the point being, with lead and mercury, it's 100 times more toxic than either one of them alone. And we have combinations of these things all the time in our water, air, food. This is a slide that's a little hard to, to probably follow, but the concurrent exposure to metals, you Exposure to other metals and chemicals can also influence how a person responds to mercury, meaning that we're all different, we all have a little different biological clock, we all have different toxins in us, um, even our gene, we, we respond differently to things. This is Tom McGuire, he should be here this week, excuse me. Uh, mercury, and this is according to him, mercury is the most poisonous, non radioactive naturally occurring substance on our planet. Okay, plutonium is more toxic, but that says a lot about mercury. And it's in our fillings, but what the heck are we doing? You know, we're putting this in people's mouths, and it's legal. You know, go back to the old thing, you know, you can stick mercury filling in somebody's mouth, but when you take it out of their mouth, it's toxic waste. You, you've got to dispose of that properly. Well, you can't just throw it in the trash. And I don't know what happens in the mouth, what changes it so much to become toxic waste that it wasn't when you put it in. But when I was in school, the only, the only thing we had to do Mercury safe wise is put the scrap that came out of the titrator, we didn't use it all, and put it in a little jar, had oil in it, and put the lid on it. That was it. You know, we're sitting in that clinic, when clinic we're building in school, I've been a couple years since I went to the school, but that's, that same operative clinic was there. 
And there's got to be 50 chairs in that room. And it's a two-story building, the roof ceiling's higher than this, I think. But um, we're in there with no assistant, drilling these things. My, you, my private is about But we're drilling these things out with no assistant half the time we don't even water them. So you can imagine the toxicity of that room. And you know, the problem with that, the student is there for four years. Those employees are there for years and years and years. So, and, and you know, I go back to another thing. You know, we look at this, and we're doing all this with a patient, okay? Well, a dentist is there eight hours a day. The assistant's there eight hours a day. So eight hours a day, if you're not using the proper techniques, you're going to be sitting there absorbing mercury paper. And it's in the, it's on your, it's on your blinds, it's on your wallpaper, it's on the floor, it's in everywhere around you. So your office is contaminated. No matter, with the best of intentions, it's probably contaminated. There's no safe or harmless level of mercury. Just one atom of mercury is harmful to the body. And I'll show you in a minute how many um, atoms, um, or micrograms are in uh, one atom. Amalgam building continuously releases poisonous mercury vapor. We know that. Um, if you, well, I'll show you in a minute. If you warm it up, you chew, you brush, your uh, abruxer, your inner grinding produces heat, mercury vapor comes off the tube. After all the mercury is out of the tube, the mercury building crumbles, and then you got a broken, well, we always, in my office, I'm sure you do the same thing. You know, we use the little cameras on everything, and I don't think I've ever seen a mercury building that didn't have cracks in the tube. They just do. They're going to break the tube. Uh, be careful what you do and say, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I've been working on it for two years now, I'm on my state board because they don't like uh, some of my advertising when well, I've done this before. And you can spend $10,000 with lawyers and you'll have to change some of the stuff on your website. You know, but did you win? No, you spent $10,000. Uh, so be careful. My board in North Carolina is really, really strict. Uh, some of the board, like Joe in South Carolina, this is much more lenient than mine. So be careful what you say and how you say it. I'm going to say that to you because, you know, you can work with the board, but it's dirty. So, and, you know, I'm not knocking that kind of thing, but it, it gets really expensive to defend yourself. Saying what I'm saying right now in front of you, in print. Now, getting back to cracks in the teeth. We take pictures of all these teeth and show the patient the crack. I do not ever tell anybody. And, and you got two kinds of patients. You've got some that come off the internet and they're very, very savvy on mercury. They know what's going on. They know what's going on with fluoride. Then you got a patient who just comes in with a tooth fixed. So there's two, two different kinds, which we were all saying, doesn't matter. But the patients that come in from the internet really know what they're doing. So if you don't know what you're doing, they'll figure out the heartbeat they're going someplace else. But these people are coming in going, here, I want you to do this to me. Take these mercury films out by crown my teeth, make all money, whatever, just replace them. So it's a market that's readily there, but you know, I don't ever tell anybody, Jesus, mercury film is killing you, or it's toxic, or anything like that. I show them the cracks in the tooth, and if they're mercury savvy, they want them out for health reasons. If they're not, they don't want a broken tooth. And how many times have you had somebody come in, and they say, gee, I'll eat mashed potatoes in my tooth broke. You know, they didn't break, they don't know it broke, it just came apart. But the mercury filling and spanning the track, and that's what I'm going with the portion about. I said in the one article that a mercury filling expands nine times more than the filling or a tooth does and contracts nine times more. You know, so you drink coffee, eat ice cream, you got this boom, 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 eventually it cracks the tooth. Also, this thing called, you know, the creep that we talked about in dental school, but the mercury filling naturally expands. One way or the other, it's going to break the tooth. You know, so don't put any in, that's number one. But our main concern. Not how you not put them in, it's how you take them out. That's going to be the emphasis on what we're talking about. I digress. Uh, now we're going to begin to this mercury vapor. That's not going to start from that. Any form of stimulation that heats an alcohol film will increase the use of mercury, which is coffee, grinding, brushing, and we'll show you a really good tape. Mercury, mercury film is going to occur at the moment of conception. Mercury passes through the placenta to the fetus and through breast milk to the nursing mother. Remember, mercury vapor is not is not charged. And it goes right into the placenta, it goes right to the brain, it goes all over the body. So anything coming off of those teeth, remember, mercury vapor is 80% absorbed in the body. So when it's absorbed, it's going to settle someplace. 
Chronic mercury poisoning can directly and indirectly contribute to to the increase in risk of severe. But um, I don't know that we can actually, as I said earlier, prove that. I mean, we think that, and you get this stuff out of the people, and they usually get better for a number of reasons. Uh, I'll talk about that later, but here's a, look, I find this chart interesting because we lose, it's easy to um, lose grasp of, you say, okay, uh, you got a microgram of mercury. Well, you got one ounce is 28 grams. And this isn't, I didn't, this isn't a tracker from prison. Um, Dave maybe put this on, so if I move, the camera follows me. But um, it's not a weekend pass anyway. So I got 28 grams. Um, one gram is 1,000 milligrams. And, a, and one milligram is 1,000 micrograms. And how many atoms in one microgram of mercury? It's four trillion. Now I said one atom of mercury, I'm crunching my lozenger, um, can disrupt a, an enzyme. So if you've got a little bit, and we're, I'll show you later how many average micrograms Americans are absorbing with their fillings, we've got four trillion atoms. <coughs> That's a lot, of, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of mercury. Now this is an interesting slide. It's one of my faves because it's an electromicrograph of a mercury filling. And what it's showing, I don't have a pointer, but you can see these balls and little circles in the balls. That's un, I don't know if it's dissolved, unmixed mercury in the amalgam filling, in the mercury filling. So you can see most of it looks pretty consistent. And then you've got these balls. That's just mercury waiting to be released. So at the top of that one, you can see it's almost at the surface. Well, that's where the mercury vapor is coming off. As you wear that filling down, that mercury is now exposed, it vaporizes, and you're breathing it in. So once that little globule is done, you got another and another and another. Because you can't completely mix amalgam. So that's where the mercury vapor comes from. Now, amalgam mercury fillings are often, as we said, silver fillings. You can call them that if you want. But they're comprised 50% of elemental mercury. 50% of that filling is mercury. 50% is a combination of silver, copper, tin, and zinc, creating, created by a mixing process. You all know titration. I don't have a titrator in my office. Any, I haven't had one in 20 years. And there was somebody came out with a new cement. The salesman was showing me. <laughs> he said, well, just put it in your titrator, and we'll mix this up and see how you like it. I was like, no sense of me buying this because I don't have one. So I didn't get that made, that cement. Um, a major reason biological dentistry is needed. Chemistry in the FDA tells us when combining many components, if you've got cornflakes, I think the next biggest ingredient might be sugar, but corn is the number one. So when combining many components, the compound should be named based on the largest ingredient. That's why we call them mercury fillings. We don't, that's something else the first go around. This is my second go around with the board. Um, I was calling them mercury fillings. We went around and around and around and around about, no, you're going you're gonna to call them amalgam fillings. I said, well, I'll be damned. I mean, I've got to write a speech. They're mercury. Well, how about if you call them silver amalgam? I said, no. I'm going to call them mercury. Well, how about if you call them amalgam mercury fillings? I said, no, I'm calling them mercury fillings. So I got, I got that one okay. But I had to take a number of pages off my, uh, my website because and that was 10 years ago, I guess. Because um, you couldn't prove a correlation between mercury and whatever disease that was. You just you can't actually do that. But, you know, there's a lot of connections that you can say, gee, that's kind of scary. But um, just be careful uh, with the board. If you ask me later, I'll be happy to answer any question. Uh, I might, you might call me experienced with the uh, state board. And this is not about patient complaints. they got nothing to do with patients. These are colleagues of mine who were perhaps a bit jealous of our success. Um, of our position in, in the community, you know, you get, it, dentists don't like, to a large extent, guys are doing what we're doing. I mean, you go to, an, you go to the local dental meeting and you, you know, you want to go talk about the toxicity of mercury. Uh, it's kind of like going to the Baptist church and talking about abortion. You know, it's just not what they want to talk about. So they get a, they get a little antsy about this. Um, also, you know, when you start doing this, um, 
your staff looks at you like, well, we've been doing this this way for 15 years. Why the change? Your patients will go, well, why aren't you using that mercury anymore? And you got to kind of explain them, oh, there's just something better. You know, Ford doesn't apologize for last year's model. I've learned something new, and this is what we're doing. So the transition from a typical dentist to being a biological dentist is uh, sometimes a little difficult because your colleagues, as I mentioned, I don't want to say shun you. If they're friends, they won't, but they get jealous. And, and when they see stuff I've written in different magazines about mercury or fluoride, for that matter, um, they send it to the board. And the board looks at that, and then they look at your website, and, and pretty soon you get a letter. You've experienced that, have you? Yeah. And it's not a patient complaint. It's not at all. I'm trying to do the best I can for my patients, but the board doesn't see it that way. So, you know, I'm not blaming the board. I mean, that's just their viewpoint. They get a narrow viewpoint. And we all went to great dental schools. I certainly did. Number, Indiana was number one when I graduated, probably because of my excellence in dentistry, I think, at the time. But um, Carolina I went down, of course, in North Carolina, Carolina's number one. Um, but it's it, it just, we're trained that way. And that's the way we believe. It's very difficult. The ADA says that's true. And by golly, that's true. That's just going to be the way it is. It's so slow to change. It's a mercury filling. Now here's dispersaloy. Now this was hot when I was in school. I don't know what they're using now. I haven't used stuff in over 20 years. But uh, this is the, um, what do they call that? DMSA or SDS, the safety data sheet or something. This is the one on dispersaloy. And, and this, is, uh, this is on the product, you know. It's contraindicated in expectant mothers, children under six, proximal occlusal contact of dissimilar metals, um, in patients with severe renal deficiency, in patients with known allergies to amalgam. You know, Baylor uh, Dental School did a study years ago, and they discovered that 30% of their students in school, dental school, were allergic to mercury. Now, I don't ever think about testing mercury, you know, with allergies. We just get it out of there. Uh, but for a dentist, that could be a bad thing, or for an assistant. For retrograde or endodontic fillings, I don't know how many times, you know, you see somebody come in with a great big amalgam mass at the end of that root. Well, you know, we don't, nobody gets apicos in my office. That tooth comes out, implant goes in. Um, as a filling material under a cast crown, see it all the time. You take a gold crown off and the mercury's still under there. Many times you have a big old amalgam tattoo. I know when I was taught in school that amalgam tattoos were because the, the, the 400,000 RPMs of the burr spun the amalgam into the gum. That's not it. It's, it's you know, electrolysis that's causing that, that dissimilar metal from the gold and the mercury into the tissue. All right, safety data sheet. That's what I was trying to think of. Uh, formerly known as the uh, MSDS sheet, which is forever in my mind, are required by OSHA to protect workers by supplying them with the most crucial facts about the hazardous materials in the job site. The physical property of the material, proper storage and handling, health risks, and essential emergency procedures. Manufacture of amalgam fillings must create these information sheets. All right. So toxicological information, chronic health effects. Oops, sorry. There we go. I told you I'd bump that a couple of times. Inhalation of mercury vapor dust or organic vapors of skin absorption. Uh, mercury over long periods can cause mercurialism. mercurialism. Sym um, symptoms include tremors, inflammation of the mouth and gums, excessive salivation, stomatitis, blue lines on the gum, amalgam tattoo, um, pain, and numbness in the extremities, weight loss, mental depression, nervousness, exposures may aggravate kidney disorders, blah, 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 blah. You know, this kind of reminds me, have you guys seen a lot of Lyme's patients now? People come in with Lyme's disease. You know, 10 years ago, I didn't see anybody with Lyme's disease because it wasn't diagnosed. You know, it largely mimics sometimes MS and other things. But in my community, is a lot of it, you know, because North Carolina is a very, very rural state, you know, mountains and lots of woods and trees. But the point is, um, you, you see this litany of things that mercury could cause or we think they could cause. Well, the same thing kind of with, with Lyme's disease. So what's happening, a lot of these people have a lot of things going on in their mouth. You know, they have root canals that are bad. They have mercury. They have dissimilar products. They may, you know, put... And, and going back to, 
what we do, well, not every patient, but the patient who wants it, is we do product testing. So we'll send off, they go to the physician, get some blood drawn, they spin that down, send it off to the labs, which you'll learn more about that are here. And they do sensitivity testing. It's the antigen-antibody reaction testing to see what materials you can use on them. Because just because you're going to have a composite or even an etch, you, you, you can't use it on this patient. Now, interesting now, because some of these etches are made by the same manufacturer. You know, they make phosphoric etch. But it may be the colorant they put in it or something is different. So we go through, the staff goes through, and they mark things that we can use and we can't use. So when the patient comes in, we're going to do a quadrant of um, Cirax or whatever it be. You know, generally, everybody can have a Cirac, uh, Emax, that is. But we got to be careful of the cement, the etching. Um, and we now can we use more of the co composite we use. I've never had anybody unable to use that. But, you know, it's something that these people want done because just because you take the mercury out doesn't mean you're going to make them better because if you put something in that they're reactive to, they're no better than they were maybe with the mercury. So there's more to it than just taking the mercury out. First aid measures, insulation device. <coughs> Excuse me, adverse symptoms may include the following reduced... Again, fetal weight, increase in fetal deaths, skeletal malformation, salivary, metallic taste, eye irritation, respiratory tract inflammation, coughing. I mean, I, you've all had patients come in and say, I got a metal taste in my mouth, you know. They, and you go, really? You look in there and they've got mercury filling. It's probably the copper in the, uh, in the filling. Who knows? I mean, it could be the, their, their pH of their, their, their saliva interacts with that. But uh, it's not unusual to have them say that nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal cramps, pain, muscle, you know, the list goes on and on and on and on. Whether all this stuff's coming from mercury, I don't know. But probably somebody with mercury fillings have had that, one of these symptoms. Okay, back to um, Henry Schein here on stratosphere, ionosphere, and troposphere. Now, I don't, I, they're all mercury fillings, but I can honestly say I don't, I don't know anything about them. Um, but the hazard indication classification, very toxic. That's great to have a product that you're putting in somebody's mouth that's listed as very toxic. By inhalation, toxic may cause harm to the, the toxic may cause the unborn child. Toxic danger is serious damage to the health by prolonged exposure through inhalation. Disposal can, must not be disposed of together with household garbage. Well, there you go. You've got to put that stuff in a special container. Um, so that tells you how good that is for you. And again, some more. This chronic long-term exposure inhalation of mercury vapor causes mercurialism. Findings are extremely variable, include tremor, shakes, salivate. You know, the list, like I said, MS is in there, uh, mar mar tattoos, um, uh, headaches, weight loss, anorexia. I mean, people come in all the time with all these different things. And, uh, you know, all this, this fatigue, chronic fatigue is a big one. We see that. I guess it's kind of like, I don't know what else, how to diagnose you, but you've got chronic fatigue. Well, a lot of these people want to get the mercury out of their mouth, and that many times helps them. That's got to be done properly. You can't just go in and grind it out of there. This is interesting. High copper amalgams have increased mercury release. Now, high copper amalgams came out. I don't know if it's got a date in here or not. I don't see a date. But I remember in dental school, dispersaloy, I think it was we used, and it was a high copper. And it was like, whoa, this is great. Because I think high copper, what did, it, did it control creep or something? Did anybody remember that? Why they put copper in? No, I don't either. But at any rate, the point being, the high copper amalgams release a lot more mercury vapor. A lot more. And you can see here that it says the high copper amalgam filling releases roughly 300 micrograms initially after placement and 782 micrograms of mercury in the first week. Now, if you go through that second paragraph, the old mercury fillings, which didn't have the high copper, is about a third of the mercury release. So the mercury released by these high copper amalgams is almost three times more than the, uh, the old type style. Mercury fillings with high copper, Oh, there it go. 1970, high levels of mercury were added to amalgam fillings. High levels of copper, excuse me. And like I said, I graduated in 79, so that's what we were trained to use. 76, increase in autoimmune disorders, specifically onset of ALS, Lou Gehrig's. Incidence of multiple sclerosis drastically increased. 
Scientific studies have found that high copper amalgams, which are still used today, release much greater amounts of mercury than low copper amalgams. So, you know, can you make that a, a definite correlation that high copper amalgams of, of causing autism or Lou Gehrig's or autism? I don't know. But there seems to be kind of a correlation there. We talked a little bit about galvanism as a direct current of electricity, especially um, when produced by chemical action. Now, I understand you got an amalgam filling that's got several different metals in it. You got a gold crown over on the upper right. You got um, silver filling over here. You've got maybe a partial denture with different metals in it. So it's no wonder there's not going to be a current. I mean, anybody's had a mercury filling and you take a piece of chew, uh, a chewing gum and you didn't get all the foil off of it, you're going to know you hit that little piece of filling with that foil. People tell me when they, they use a fork and they, the fork hits the filling, sometimes they get a shock. Um, well, that's galvanism. Oral galvan and electric currents produced by chemical action in the mouth. Um, and this is, this is uh, we were taught back in well, 70, 75 to 79, you don't put a mercury filling, <coughs> excuse me, next to a gold crown. Well, it doesn't matter if that gold crown is right next to it or on the other quadrant. There's still going to be a current going through there. So this is something that you, if you have no metal in your mouth, you don't have to worry about this. So that's what we strive for. Um, the only time I'm going to use metal is if I got a long bridge or I got a Bruxer or something like that, I'm going to make a PFM crown or bridge, whatever it be. But most everything we do, I'm sure you're the same way, is without metal. Currents in the oral cavity are measured in microamps. Okay, microamps. Well, the brain operates on nanoamps. Mercury fillings produce a thousand times more amperage than the amperage required by the brain. Now, most of you aren't old enough to remember Johnny Carson, but I did. He was the only funny guy on late night TV. And uh, he had Lucille Ball on one time. And she was talking about hearing radio in her head. And Johnny Carson just broke up. I mean, she was sitting there. She was serious. Well, that kind of means you're nuts, I guess, if you're hearing radio and without having a radio on. But many people have come to me now over the years, and they say the same thing. And it's the amperage. It's the, what's going on between the, the galvanic reaction in the mouth and the brain. And they're actually here radio. So kind of a weird thing. Get all that metal out of their mouth, they don't. But that's a lot. Of that, and right there next to the brain, how far is the upper teeth or lower teeth from the brain? I mean, not very far. And we got a thousand times more, more amperage going on. Uh, when I was in dental school, this is uh, Ralph Felt. He was our guru for dental materials. Uh, God, I remember, he always lectured right after lunch and put you to sleep. I mean, dental materials is hard enough to, to listen to, but after lunch, and he had this really low, soft voice, and it was like, oh my God, it, it, was, it was tough. Um, according to Skinner and Phillips, the insertion of mercury restoration is directly in contact with the gold crown is contraindicated. And again, I said, it doesn't have to be right next to the gold crown, but <coughs> in the mouth, excuse me why I wet my throat here. Mercury in tooth roots and in jaw bones, fourfold increase in the amount of mercury per gram of tissue weight of dent when a gold crown is placed again. You got galvanism going on there. Here is the potato clock. All right. It's a science project toy that is meant to show the power of combining metals to create electricity. We use it today to show the power of combining metals in a person's mouth to create a potato clock in your head. Here are two potatoes, each with a zinc and a copper strip embedded in them. It takes two cells of zinc and copper to run this little digital clock. When you hook them all up, the potato clock starts to run. Got it? Here's a variety of dental metals that are embedded in a potato, ready to go. This one is a pure titanium implant. This one is a titanium alloy implant. Here is a lump of amalgam. This one is the remnant of a Maryland bridge, a nickel chromium alloy. Here is the remnant of a crown, porcelain fused to mystery metal. 
Here is an ingot of high gold content, crown and bridge gold, and here is a bridge of porcelain fused to some kind of yellow crown and bridge gold. Here is one copper and zinc cell, and here is another potato with the variety of dental metals that we just described embedded into it. Let's see what happens when we hook them up. Here is a pure titanium implant, and here is some gold. We get in a potato clock. Yes, we are. Here is another gold alloy, and it is lighting up a mystery gold alloy. And there we go, we can get the contact. Here is a titanium alloy implant versus yellow gold, and that lights up the potato clock. Here's some crown and bridge gold. Here's a white gold alloy. And here is some amalgam. And you'll notice that the two electronegative metals do not light up the potato clock. Here is a remnant of a Maryland bridge, a nickel chromium alloy. And that lights up the potato clock and gold, and the white gold. There we go. What about amalgam? Here is a lump of amalgam. What does that do with a pure gold alloy? It's the potato clock. Your crown of bridge gold, a white gold alloy. What about Titanium alloy versus amalgam. Negative metals. We dentists pick metals for people's dental restorations on the basis of their mechanical properties and durability. But we rarely take into account the electrical properties of the metals. This little demonstration shows how by randomly selecting metals for people's dental restorations, it's the equivalent of creating potato clock in their heads. <clears throat> the first mercury concentration measured after removal of the amalgams was higher than the baseline for seven of the subjects. Values returned to baseline at or below the next measurement. So what I'm going to show you next, these are, these are some old studies. And what I'm going to ask you to look at, just, just follow that one bar where gay, you see that 1.76. These other studies were done maybe with less amalgams, we're not sure where the variation is. But the important thing is to note the blue and the green and the difference in that. And the blue, this is unstimulated amalgam release, meaning that the patient's sitting there in a chair, they're not grinding, they're not brushing, they're not chewing, they're just sitting there with, with you know, amalgams in their mouth, mercury fillings. So the blue is, excuse me, the, the, the green is people without amalgams, okay? So it's not exact, it's not important exactly that they measure, but I want you to see the difference. Now follow that number, 1.76 um, micrograms uh, of mercury in the breath. And then we go to stimulated, meaning we're chewing. Now you can see that goes from 1.76 to 13.1, and meaning that a lot of mercury is being released as we're chewing with mercury fillings in our mouth. And that means gum, you know, whatever, you, whatever kind of food you want to eat. Um, so that's just for the second. Now, this is unstimulated mercury release for the day. And, okay, this is with amalgam. You see the 30.4, unstimulated. And then if you're chewing, it goes to 226. Now, again, I don't know how many mercury fillings you have in your mouth or, you know, but that's a significant difference and chewing and, and not chewing. So it's not the fact that we shouldn't chew, it's the fact that we got mercury fillings in there that makes it not a good deal to chew. Now this next slide, this is showing, this is an hour graph, and what it's doing is measuring the mercury vapor coming off someone who was chewing. So we're chewing, and then they stop there, you see the, the, the vertical line, and you can see there's, a, there's a, a peak of mercury vapor, but look how long it takes the mercury vapor to fall off after you stop chewing. 
So it doesn't mean you stop chewing and mercury vapor stops. It's going, to be, it's going to come off forever, but it slowly ramps down. Mercury vapor inhalation inhibits binding of glutathione triphosphate to tubulin in rat brains. Now that's not only a rat brain, but it's a human brain too. Uh, similar to molecular lesions in Alzheimer's. Boyd Haley did this, dental silver tooth fillings. A source of mercury exposure revealed by whole body imaging. We'll show you that. And whole body imaging of the distribution of mercury released from dental fillings into monkey tissue. Okay. Well, what was done, Murray Vinnie years ago did a, uh, a little test. He made up, you know, understand that mercury is, is, does not come radioactive in, in the world. I mean, you've got to make it radioactive. So what he did, he made radioactive mercury, and then he made an amalgam out of that mercury. And what they did is they put this, my good buddy Harvey, thank you for being here, buddy. Um, they, uh, they put this in the sheep's teeth, and they let them sit for 29 days, and then they, they cut the teeth off at the gum line, and they did this under a scan, um, and they find that you can see where the mercury went. Now, number one, it, it's stomach. It went, you can see it in the jaw. Uh, you can see it in the kidneys and in the liver. So after 28 days, that was a distribution of mercury in the body. Now, obviously, sheep don't generally have mercury fillings. So this was an interesting study. And it was repeated because the ADA said, well, wait a minute, you know, sheep chew differently than we do. So I mean, I guess that makes somewhat difference. I can't imagine much of a difference. But they did it, they repeated a study in monkeys because they chew pretty much like we do. And as you can see, the, the, the outcome was basically the same. It's in the jaw, the kidneys, the intestine, and in the liver. So that's just showing that because, because he made radioactive mercury, he could track the radioactivity. Otherwise, it would be pretty difficult to do this. Now, dental mercury amalgams in pregnancy... Um, Obviously, it shows that it increased a number of maternal mercury fillings, increased levels in the fetus. Remember, mercury vapor crosses the blood-brain barrier, and it crosses the placenta. And a number of uh, maternal mercury fillings increases in the breast milk. So if mom has mercury fillings, she's going to have mercury in the breast milk. And we all know nursing is a good thing. Both the Environmental Protection Agency and the National Academy of Science state that between 8 and 10% of American women have mercury levels that would render any child they give birth to neurologically, this could be neurological disorders. Uh, that's 8 to 10%. That's a lot of women. Based on the prevalence of the overall U.S. population of women of reproductive age, the number of U.S. births each year is estimated that more than 300,000 newborns each year may have increased risk of learning disabilities. Um, we hear about that all the time, say with utero exposure to methylmercury. This study, this CAT study, was done um, years ago, and what it, the, the slide really is basically saying this. If you want to come out with a study, and you, you know what you want the end to be, I mean, you can design it so you can get whatever end you want the study to show. Well, this was done to see if mercury fillings affected girls or boys differently. And what, they, what this is saying, is, there's a lot more to this, but they redid, not the study, but they re-looked at the findings years later, only to find that with the same, some of the same scientists and some additional scientists, only to find out that the interpretations they made at the time weren't true, and mercury fillings did affect the porphyrin levels and, and other things in these children. And I think that what really is perhaps uh, plays, this guy's saying, pediatric neurologist, Mayo Clinic, don't use mercury fillings. Don't place them in children. Don't place them in anybody, but particularly in children. All right, the WHO, okay, World Health Organization, 1991. Dental amalgam is the greatest source of mercury burden in the non-occupationally exposed population. In other words, if you're a, you work in a fluorescent light bulb plant or a mercury switch plant um, or Clorox plant, you're going to be exposed to occupational mercury. But most of us, well, if you work in a dental office, yeah, you are going to be. But most of the population isn't. But what they're saying is the greatest source of mercury burden in non-occupationally exposed population, the only exposure from a mount, the only exposure from amalgam, according to WHO, is between 3 and 17 micrograms, and 10 micrograms being the average. So the WHO is saying that people with mercury fillings are getting about, um, on average, 10 micrograms a day. And then that would be met by eight surfaces of amalgam, or, you know, 
four two surface amalgam fillings would get you to the, the, the World Health Organization limit. And many of us have, well, some of us, I don't have any, but many of us have many more than that. Um, and here's, this is a good slide because what this is showing, as I mentioned earlier, is that it's not, the, it's not so much the environment that we're getting the mercury from, it's the amalgams, mercury fillings, silver fillings. And you can see that, I think that's, I'm having a hard time, what percentage that is, it doesn't really say, but you can see the pie, it's, it's pretty big from the uh, uh, amalgam fillings, and air a little bit, and fish and seafood a little bit. So it's not so much the fish we're eating um, as it is the amalgams that are in our mouth. Combination of mercury exposure, some fish, oh, excuse me, fish and European food safety. Okay, estimated exposure to inorganic mercury in Europe from the diet alone does not exceed the um, tolerable weekly intake. Um, inhaled uh, mercury vapor from dental amalgams, which after absorption is converted to inorganic mercury, is an additional source that is likely to increase the internal mercury um, exposure. So again, it's not what we're eating, it's, it's the mercury, mer mercury fillings in the mouth that's getting, giving us the biggest load. Um, this is a, a, just a chart that shows you, this is the EPA limit, that red line. And you can see the different mercury uh, tests that have been done over the years. And about every one but what, three, two are above the line. So the amount of mercury we're getting off of mercury fillings is, is contributing to the body burden. All right, why mercury free, mercury safe, and biological dentistry? Uh, it may cause harm effect to the nervous digestive. We've been through this repository immune system. I've from mercury exposure can be tremors, impaired vision. I'm telling you, there's a litany of things that, you know, we, we can associate health problems with mercury. Now, everyone, I don't know, but there's a lot of them. No threshold, which some adverse effects do not occur. Remember, I said one mercury atom can affect uh, the enzymes in the body. Richardson, um, he's been here many times, good guy. Um, updating exposure, oops, I'm sorry. There we go. Let me go back here. I told you I'd mess this up. Updating exposure, re-examining levels. Okay, it was determined that some 67.2 million Americans, and this, this is about 10 year old, well, it's 2010, nine years old, uh, would exceed the mercury dose associated with a reference dose of 0.3 micrograms per cubic meter, established by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. So uh, that's saying that 67 million Americans are over the limit uh, that the EPA would suggest that you could have, uh, and I don't know if there's any safe mercury dosage, but um, what they're considering safe. Mercury-induced vascular toxicity, impairment of angiogenesis. This is by Paranundi, Ohio State. Um, transitional heavy metals attached to lipids in the endothelium of the blood level. Uh, blood vessels, altering lipid signaling met, met mediators, prostaglandins are released causing inflammation and tears in the membrane plaque forms to repair the damage. What that's saying is that the mercury vapor is actually attacking the blood vessel lining and causing lesions there. Now what happens is the cholesterol comes in to try to patch that lesion and you get a build up of plaque. Now the same thing, I don't know if you remember Dr. Levy, anybody read his books? Um, he's a cardiologist, and he's here many times. I don't know if he's here this weekend or not, but he's been here many times. His theory on that was um, uh, localized scurvy because of a lack of vitamin C. It's a really interesting book he's got out, but he's got two out now. But his theory was that uh, the, the current heart disease is being caused by lack of vitamin C with localized scurvy. Again, the cholesterol comes in to patch the, the, the wound, you might say, and it builds up and causing um, the heart damage. Mercury causes cytotoxicity and vascular epithelium, and mercury, uh, methylmercury causes mitochondrial damage. Um, you know, mercury will replace the iron in the transport system, which then no longer works. So in the electron transport system, it goes down, so does your energy, but it really affects the mitochondria. Mercury affects on nerve fibers. Uh, demyelination of nerve fibers can lead to diseases such as MS, a loose Gehrig disease, Alzheimer's, and mental illness. How mercury causes brain neuron degeneration. Mercury has long been known to be a potent neurotoxic substance, whether it is inhaled or consumed in the diet as a food contaminant. 
Over the past 15 years, medical research laboratories have established that dental amalgam tooth fillings are a major contributor to mercury body burden. In 1997, a team of research scientists demonstrated that mercury vapor inhalation by animals produced a molecular lesion in brain protein metabolism, which was similar to a lesion seen in 80% of Alzheimer diseased brains. Recently completed experiments by scientists at the University of Calgary's Faculty of Medicine now reveal, with direct visual evidence from brain neuron tissue cultures, how mercury ions actually alter the cell membrane structure of developing neurons. To better understand mercury's effect on the brain, let us first illustrate what brain neurons look like and how they grow. In this animation, we see three brain neurons growing in a tissue culture, each with a central cell body and numerous neurite processes. At the end of each neurite is a growth cone where structural proteins are assembled to form the cell membrane. Two principal proteins involved in growth cone function are actin, which is responsible for the pulsating motion seen here, and tubulin, a major structural component of the neurite membrane. During normal cell growth, Tubulin molecules link together end to end to form microtubules, which surround neurofibrils, another structural protein component of the neuronal axon. Shown here is the neurite of a live neuron isolated from snail brain tissue, displaying linear growth due to growth cone activity. It is important to note that growth cones in all animal species, ranging from snails to humans, have identical structural and behavioral characteristics and use proteins of virtually identical composition. In this experiment, neurons also isolated from snail brain tissue were grown in culture for several days, after which very low concentrations of mercury were added to the culture medium for 20 minutes. Over the next 30 minutes, the neurite membrane underwent rapid degeneration, leaving behind the denuded neurofibrils seen here. In contrast, other heavy metals added at this same concentration, such as aluminum, lead, cadmium, and manganese, did not produce this effect. To understand how mercury causes this degeneration, let us return to our illustration. As mentioned before, tubulin proteins link together during normal cell growth to form the microtubules which support the neurite structure. When mercury ions are introduced into the culture medium, they infiltrate the cell and bind themselves to newly synthesized tubulin molecules. More specifically, the mercury ions attach themselves to the binding site reserved for guanosine triphosphate, or GTP, on the beta subunit of the affected tubulin molecules. Since bound GTP normally provides the energy which allows tubulin molecules to attach to one another, mercury ions bound to these sites prevent tubulin proteins from linking together. Consequently, the neurite's microtubules begin to disassemble into free tubulin molecules, leaving the neurite stripped of its supporting structure. Ultimately, both the developing neurite and its growth cone collapse, and some denuded neurofibrils form aggregates or tangles, as depicted here. Shown here is a neurite growth cone stained specifically for tubulin and actin, before and after mercury exposure. Note that the mercury has caused disintegration of tubulin microtubule structure. These new findings reveal important visual evidence as to how mercury causes neurodegeneration. More importantly, this study provides the first direct evidence that low-level mercury exposure is indeed a precipitating factor that can initiate this neurodegenerative process within the brain. Interesting. What happens to 80% of the mercury vapor absorbed into the body from dental amalgam fillings? Absorbed by the lungs and passed to the rest of the body, particularly the brain, kidney, liver, lung, and gastrointestinal tracts. The half-life of metallic mercury in the various organs is about 58 days, but can be decades in the brain. Meaning, you know, half-life is something when half of it's removed, then you got the other half, then you got the other half, and then you got the other half. You know, just 58 days sounds like, whoa, that's not a big problem. But when you get down to zero, that is quite a while. But in the, in the brain, um, it can stay there for decades and a half life. So it's going to take a long, long time to get it out of the brain. And again, you know, as practicing dentists, we're sitting there all day breathing that in along with the assistants. So 
you know, it's, it's one thing for the general public to be doing that, but it's another thing for us. And again, I don't mean to be selfish about this, but, you know, the patient appreciates it, but I'm doing it for me and my assistants. I mean, we're there all day long doing this, and uh, we'd like to go home and, and live happy, retired lives someday. Um, this is symptoms of mercury exposure again. Uh, you know, some of these get a little redundant, but endocrine disruptions, headaches, insomnia, psychological issues, and, and nerve response changes, uh, renal changes, tremors. Um, you know, people come in with a lot of this stuff. Is it all mercury poisoning? I don't know. But we're going to get it out, and we're going to treat them the same way, whether they're coming in for a toothache or they're coming in for a mercury revision. They all get treated the same way because we're not going to sit there and absorb this mercury if we don't have to. So we're going to use all of our all of our skills and safety measures. And you'll learn more about that. Joe, after me, will go into more detail about what we actually do to protect ourselves and our staff. Dental mercury has been scientifically linked to these health issues uh, from scientific research. And again, everybody responds differently. I um, mean, I've got patients that come in with a mouthful of mercury fillings. They're 70, 80 years old, don't have, a, don't have an issue in the world, or they're fine. Somebody else can come in, and they had three mercury fillings, and they've got some neurological problem that's driving them nuts. So uh, it's the same way with smokers. You know, somebody smokes all their life, they don't get lung cancer, or their wife does. You know, it's, it's, the response is very different for everybody. So I'm not in any way saying all, all these conditions are a direct result of mercury. We don't know. But uh, there's certain connections. Again, you got, we know periodontal disease, um, hearing loss, kidney disease, uh, Parkinson's, reproductive dysfunction, thyroiditis, um, Lou Gehrig's. Again, I told you about my aunt dying and two cousins from it. Um, that was scary. Genetic predisposition and dental mercury risks. Well, what this is saying is that we've got the CPOX4, we've got the APOE 2, 3, and 4. Everybody's got a little genetic variance in them. So what affects me might not affect you. Uh, I, don't, I get poison ivy, you may not. It's that kind of thing. And uh, so the interesting thing on this APO uh, 3, 4, there's APO 2, 3, and 4. And what, what that is, that's a, uh, it's a protein that carries cholesterol in the cerebral spinal fluid. And you have, if you're a 2, you're in good shape because 2 has two cysteine molecules on it. APO 3 has a cysteine and an arginine. And APO 4 has two arginines. Now, why that's important? because the arginine won't, won't transmit or translate mercury out of the body. The cysteines, the two thiol groups, has the greatest affinity for mercury. So what they're saying with this is that if you're an APO2, you probably have a low risk of Alzheimer's disease, and you're, you are secreting mercury. Now, when we talk about secretion, um, you, you get these autistic children, and mom comes in and says, well, we had their hair tested, and they didn't have any mercury in their hair. Well, if you're, if you're not a secretor, if you're an APO4, you're hoarding the mercury. It's staying in the body. If you're an APO2, it's coming out of the body, in your sweat, in, in your hair. So being APO2, if, you, if they detect mercury in your hair, it's probably a good thing because your body knows to get rid of it. If they don't, that doesn't necessarily mean you don't have any. You could be loaded with it. It's just com not coming out that way. Why aren't we all dead? Well, that's a question many dentists ask me. Well, I'm not having any problems, but we don't know you don't. Um, and again, this is what I just talked about, the reduced mercury detoxifying capacity if you're an APO4. And you can get this tested, find out what you are. I haven't because I don't know what I'm going to do with the information anyway. Worry about it. <laughs> you know, I'm doing everything I can not to. I'm constantly chelating myself through physicians, but we're taking things that, you know, Corella, and there's a number of different things you can take. High sulfur foods, onions, eggs, garlic, broccoli, cauliflower um, help. A lot of patients do that on their own. But there's a number of things you can do safely um, by yourself by the health food store and, and to help reduce it. I would suggest uh, you do as I've done, which I work with alternative physicians in Winston. Um, they send me patients, I send them, and, and they know what we're doing. But they can help you if you're interested in more either IV chelation or DMSA, which is a tablet. But there's different ways you can work with the physicians and for you to get the mercury out. And APO2, as it says, the greatest mercury detoxifying capacity. Low hair mercury in autistic children, I mentioned that. That's not a good thing. Autistic children have very high mercury levels, probably coming from mom. Mom probably had a mouthful of metal fillings, mercury fillings. And we know that it's coming in the breast milk. 
And it's been suggested that first child is probably the most affected with the Alzheimer spectrum because they pulled the mercury out. And again, we've talked about the 90-year-old patient full of amalgams and they're healthy. Um, you know, I've, I've seen it many times. And yeah, I don't tell them they need to get their mercury fillings out. You know, I'm going to tell them something's going to break and I'm going to fix it. If they want them out, I'm very happy to be there to do that for them. Dr. Wood stated, 25% to 50% of people have genetic variations. So, you know, we're not all the same. We know that. We react differently to this stuff. A lifetime risk of neurological damage. And noted, we're <coughs> not talking about a small risk here. Now, <coughs> excuse me. I mentioned the Baylor study that a third of their class was allergic to mercury. Approximately 21 million mercury, uh, mer mer Americans are likely allergic to mercury. Metal allergies are known to be on the rise. I mean, why is that? I don't know why. Maybe because there's so many toxic things in our environment now that we're just becoming hypersensitive. Uh, I, I read once and I forgot how, much, how many different toxic products there were in the last 30 years that we don't even think about. When we're rubbing them on our bodies, spraying them on our hair, whatever. Most dental patients are not tested for mercury allergies. I don't test anybody for mercury allergies. I just get it out. There's no point in testing for an allergy. I just, it's got other things going for it. Let's get it out of there. Health conditions linked to dental mercury fillings. Allergies include autoimmune diseases, fatigue, multiple chemical sensitivities, oral lichen planets, you know, a lot of things. A number of patients have health conditions linked to dental mercury fillings. They improve or they don't improve. Now, the biological responses, and I've seen all this, Mercury is a time-dose relationship. The more you have, the longer it's in there, the more your body contains. Amalgam is not stable. We talked about that. It's easily oxidized, and it acts as a battery. Wait a minute here. There. We've got to get it on the right time here. Um, amalgam is not stable. Uh, people respond in one of five ways. No change at all in their health. Have that happen. They've got better teeth. They don't have any breaking teeth. They're, they look prettier good thing. Worse, if increased exposure due to poor removal. In other words, if you just go in there and just rip all mercury fillings without the proper precautions, those patients can get worse, and they certainly do. You can use all the proper precautions, and a patient for a short time will be worse. Because I don't care how good you are, your technique or whatever, there's going to be some mercury release. It's going to be absorbed somehow. And again, Joe will go through our protocol a little later to show you how we do that, but it ain't perfect. I mean, it's good, but we keep coming up with better ways of protecting ourselves and the patient. Better health after detoxification with a physician. Remember, all we're doing is getting it out of the mouth. The physician, the alternative physician, will get it out of the body. Now, I've had a lot of people come in and they say, well, I've had a blood test. I don't have any mercury. Well, mercury only stays in the blood for about 48 hours. And then it's deposited in the tissue. So if you have no mercury in your blood, you know, big deal. You shouldn't. It's already deposited in your tissues. Better health immediately. I've had that too, and it's probably an electrical response. But I've had many patients that actually say, you know, it took me about three months, but I feel much different. So it kind of takes a little while. You're not, you know, not going to just jump up and go, oh my God, what a difference, unless it's an electrical response. And then they'll notice it almost immediately. Some better after macro removal and more after physician's detox is what I was saying. So once we get it out of the mouth, you know, that's, it's still in the body, so I'd encourage the physician to go in there and do some chelation. And this is a little hard to read, but again, this is showing that the, the, the burden coming from our ingress of mercury is coming from dental amalgam, mercury fillings. It's not coming from the environment, although a small portion of it does. You know, we know coal-fired power, power plants have a, a great deal of mercury and, uh, in their exhaust, and that's being controlled. I read one study where... Um, the, the EPA is, is this going off and on? It sound weird to me. The EPA is trying to get the, um, the smoke from a coal-fired power plant, the mercury content, lower than what people breathe in and out every day of their own mercury fillings. That's a tough, tough thing to do. How are we doing on time, Cole? Okay, when do you want me to stop? All right. Well, I'll probably be done for then. I can talk about other things if you want to. Pa painting houses. You don't want to know about doing that. All right. And Carby and I, we've actually done some, some roofing together. Yeah. 
All right, <clears throat> this is a chart. It's, it's hard to read this. It's, what it's showing you is just that, um, you know, the mercury deposits in different places. It's in the mom, mom's milk. Um, it, it's in the gut. It's in the fetus. Uh, it comes out f through the, uh, f f um, the, the stool. Uh, that's the best way to get rid of it. You don't want to get rid of it through the kidneys. You want to have it come out through the stool. So when you do chelate with a physician, make sure that that's the route that you want, that's going to go through because it can affect the kidneys drastically. A growing volume of recently published scientific research is examining how mercury exposure, including that from dental amalgam fillings, can pose highly significant risks to genetic variations. Now, again, we talked about the CPOX, we talked about the APOE. Um, so everybody's got a little variation. In fact, I think it was said 50% of us have these variations, so they're going to affect the mercury uh, storage or elimination. And again, this is back to the health conditions. Uh, we probably have more than these than we need, but uh, it's just saying that uh, allergies, especially to mercury, um, you know, you got the autism thing going on, you got uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, <clears throat> complaints of um, ulcer causation, kidney disease, hearing loss. I think that's more from dentists from the drill than it is from mercury, maybe. I don't know. Uh, and suicidal indications. So, mercury research. Reviewing risk of exposure to dentist. Um, this is interesting, and I, I don't know that this is really readable here. Increase, but uh, this this was done. Is this Dobrinsky's study, Griff? No. Okay. Well, yeah. This this got in on me here. Um, I can I can speak more to Dobrinsky. He's uh, as I mentioned before. He's a dentist at Yale. And he's they have a graduate dental school, and he did a study on, on retired dentists and found that they have the highest prescriptions for neurological and cardiac um, problems. So if you want to believe it or not, why do dentists have a higher rate of cardiac and neurological problems in retirement? I don't know. You know, we used to think we had a higher suicide, divorce, and alcoholism rate, and you know maybe we thought it was because of the stress of the job. I don't know if that sets, you know, after a while, it's not so stressful, you get used to it, but perhaps it's the mercury, I don't know. And so this again, more about, you know, the, the, the problems with mercury, Parkinson's disease is still uncertain, although a positive association between dental amalgam and uh, Parkinson's disease has been found in a few cases in controlled studies. Um, the same number of patients who had no new amalgams filling as restored was matched by sex, age, and treatment date. Uh, both cohorts were followed up with treatment date until the date of the diagnosis of uh, Parkinson's death or the end of the, of the year. And this uh, study, this is the Dobrinsky study I was telling you about. Uh, the health st uh, status of dentists exposed to mercury from silver amalgam tooth restorations. Uh, notable quote, it would seem prudent to advise the dentist considering using restorations do not contain mercury. I would suggest it's probably prudent to watch how you remove the mercury because the placement of it isn't really that big of a deal for us. You're not grinding the mercury out of there. You're just putting it in the tooth. So the, the, I would guess that the um, mercury contamination in the room wouldn't be nearly as much as when you turn on that drill. Dentists are injured by exposure to mercury. Does Prinsky again? He's got the psychiatric, and the, the dentists are the blue line. The pink is the control study. So you got psychiatric, neurologic, um, psych, psychological, respiratory, and cardiovascular. Um, you can see that there's five different categories there that retired dentists are much higher on than the general population. Again, why? Well, could be exposure to mercury. I don't think it's the job. I guess that's the uh, end of the line for me. I know. Um. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, Sophie God? Is mercury toxic? Elemental mercury is toxic. Silver amalgam fillings, does it contain mercury? It does. Almost up to 50%? Yes. Mercury is a toxic substance. A lot of us have dental amalgams that contain mercury. Anywhere from 4 to 19 micrograms of mercury per day can leach out of your amalgams into your body. 
a single filling delivers micrograms of mercury, which in mercury terms is a lot. Mercury is vaporizing from the amalgams, and you have 80% absorption through the lungs. This is a fairly dangerous scenario. Let's go to dental school. They're taught that mixed dental amalgam is completely inert. They taught us nothing about protecting the staff from the dangers of mercury vapor. The amount of mercury vapor that's released from amalgam restorations is so minute. And so when a dentist goes in to grind out an amalgam filling, he is creating tremendous quantities of mercury particulate. Their dental drill runs at about 400,000 RPM, and it sends a shower of micron size and submicron size particles everywhere. It's tens of thousands of parts per million. I've never seen levels of mercury this high. That's pretty much unheard of in any type of work environment. When a woman is pregnant, we hope that she's never exposed to mercury vapor, because we know that it can pass the placenta and cause neurological problems in the unborn baby. Everyone working around hazardous chemicals and other toxic substances has a right to know of possible dangers and how to protect themselves. When patients see us dressed like this, there's no way they can believe mercury is safe in their house. If you're exposed to mercury, we start seeing much more serious health effects. Uh, these health effects would be chronic fatigue, double vision, couldn't sleep, depression, panic attacks, memory loss, a lowered immune system, loss of vision, chronic headaches. It's both an immediate problem in some individuals and a very long-term problem in others. I started having neurological symptoms. I didn't feel like a human being. In the deepest part of myself, I thought I was dying. People think you're crazy, and, and you're not crazy. You have mercury poisoning. They'll evacuate a public building for a broken thermometer, but each one of your amalgam fillings has about the same amount of mercury. Two schools will be closed tomorrow after a custodian finds a small amount of mercury on the floor of a room at Hickman Mills High School. Now, how much mercury are we talking about? Not very much. About the amount the size of the eraser on this pencil, but school officials explained to us it would only take the amount of mercury about the size of the sharpened end of this pencil to contaminate the entire building. The toxin that can do the effect you have it placed within inches of your brain. They've never done any safety studies on this product. Why is it that the ADIA will not tell the public that mercury amalgam is harmful? Frankly, the American Dental Association welcomes uh, new books and, and all of the dental restorative materials. The American people are being overtly lied to by the American Dental Association.